So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today I have Michael Harringman and David Quassel of Quassel Midgen, a solicitor's firm in London. And today we want to talk about partner-led service. Over to you, David and Michael, if you'd like to introduce yourself uh, for the benefit of our readers and listeners. Okay. Well, I'm managing partner of Quastel Midgen, mm-hmm. and um, Quastel Midgen was a merger between Quastels and Avery Midgen. Mm-hmm. And uh, Michael, let you introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Michael Herring, and I'm senior partner of Quastel Midgen. Uh, and as David said, it was a merger of Quastels and Avery Midgen. Might be useful. I just tell you how the merger came about because of course. even that was a bit, was a bit fortuitous. But it was one of the best pieces of fortune that I think happened to both of us. Um, we we were Avery Midgen in uh, Oxford Street, mm-hmm. and our lease was coming to an end. And I said to my then, well, still my partner, I said to to him, um, yeah, what should we do? Shall we renew the lease or shall we look to, to do a merger? We never have thought the bigger was better, particularly, but. We thought it might be time to, to to see if we could merge with somebody. So we put an advert in the Law Society Gazette, which at that time was actually bristling with adverts for mergers and recruitment. And um, we got 66 replies. Blimey. Advert, and we sat there one evening going through these replies, and we filed every single one of them in the waste paper bin. So I said, look, the lease is coming to an end. I'd better get in touch with the landlords. We'd better try and... Re- renew this because I don't think, I think I've gone off the whole merger idea that seem, seem to be out there. So he comes into town every day for breakfast. Right. And a couple of days, a couple of days later, he came into the, my office and said, "I met some guys who've got uh, some offices in Wimpole Street and they've got some available space. What do you think? What do you think about?" It? I said, well, "I think I've gone off the whole idea." He said, "Well, you might as well have a meeting with them. Might see them." So I said, "All right. Well, you know, I'll always sit down and talk to somebody." Uh, let's have a meeting. So he fixed up a meeting. We came into this very room one afternoon. As these things always on a very busy day, and I thought, you know, what am I doing here? I don't really want to be doing this at all. And we started talking, and it was just one of those things. Uh, the more I tried to persuade myself that this was a complete waste of time, the more I realised, fortunately, that it was nothing but one waste of time. That this was this was a very very good fit. Yes. And this is exactly what we should be doing. So... And how long ago was that? Was that? that was 2002. 2002. So, so, and and this is your 11th birthday. Yeah, 11th birthday. birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Happy birthday. And it, thank you. I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and no lie. Uh, and it was... Um, it, it, it actually... And it worked out almost... Well, not almost. From day one. It was ex- extraordinary the way it fitted together. And I was actually saying to, to my wife this morning, you know, um, I don't know where the eleven years have gone, but it seems as though we've all seems as though we've always been here, and it was really really a case of the whole is much better than the two halves, mm-hmm. much better, and it it just seemed to to, to to go go well. And all right, we've had recessions and you know all those other things, but which we've thankfully come through through pretty well. The firm has grown pretty steadily during the eleven years, and when we started off, we were. Five partners. Five partners. We're, we're now eleven now partners, 11 partners yeah. and it's grown into. And what we've tried to do, and I mean, David, you stop me if you disagree at all. What we've tried to do is we've tried to not just sit here saying, "Well, what a pity this is," and well, that sort of work is drying up. But we've gone out to see whether we can find other work, and we have managed through a lot of hard work to by a lot of people to get a spread of work mm-hmm. across a lot of the traditional stuff, which. Frankly, we've always had a supply of, and to add it to that, new areas um, which have become you know, very fruitful. So mm-hmm. that's the, that's the way we've we've done it, and thankfully, up to this moment, it's been uh, it's been pretty successful. Yeah. I mean, we made a conscious effort to buck the trend of nature of a firm of solicitors. Okay, and that was and that is to have, as you've said earlier, a, a very flat open relationship right. with our, rather not that, staff, our team. Rather than a hierarchical... Yeah. yeah. There's no Mr and Mrs. There's no formalities. And uh, it's very much earning respect out of performance mm-hmm. and leading by example. Okay. And from that we've managed to keep people. I can count on oh, three fingers. Maybe four, four people have left in the last 11 years. 
And you don't lock them up downstairs. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, our receptionist has been with us for 15 years, you know, and this isn't unusual. People mm. are just with us because they enjoy it. Yeah. We have good fun, we, but we're very serious as well. And it also get, it also makes, um, I don't know if you know, the. Uh, there's a saying that says people join companies but leave bosses. Yeah. Which is sort of a testament, to obviously, to yeah. to yourselves yeah. and also the you know your yeah. your colleagues in the team that you that you're well, building. Well, we, we emphasize over and over again that it's a family. Yes, mm. it's the cross Midian family, and it, it, we create a family atmosphere, and we try to look after everyone, and uh, and, and, and you know, frankly, it, it works, and people do feel that yeah. that loyalty. And do you think that's the thing that I'm really interested in is customer experience or client experience, customer service and things. Now, um, do you think that's become more important over the last sort of 11 years? And is it that, that, that the, the industry has become more competitive or is it the client expectations have gone up? And if so, you know, how have you guys sort of responded? Those, I think all of those things. Mm. Okay. I think, yes, of course it's become more competitive. Um, and, you know, if you go back 20 years, mm. nobody ever asked you what fee you were going to, to charge. Nobody for, quibbled for, on price. Nobody, nobody quibbled. Now, most people ask before they start, what, what's, what's your, you can have a quote for this. Yes. And, and you give it to them, and, and in most cases, they accept it. So, and, but they, and, you know, and, you, and you also find that in certain cases, uh, you know, people like to use more than one firm of solicitors sometimes. Mm -hmm. So that, that, it is more competitive, yes. But, um, and, and, and people want value. Yes. For their money. That's very, you know, they're, they're happy to pay. I mean, we're, we're not, we don't do things, we're not the cheapest. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned earlier on service. Yes. And service is very, very important. And you know, we, we make sure all the time that people are getting a service, that people are phoned back when they when they leave a message, that things are dealt with promptly. I'm so, so surprised, by the way. It's how many law firms don't do that. No, it's yeah. terrible. A really, really it's simple awful. skill. It's the worst thing that can happen. There are, two, there are two cardinal sins you can make. Not phoning a client back, even if it's just to tell them, look, I can't deal with this today, but you know, I will have it. Sure. It, it's being looked at. Uh, and the other big sin is misspelling a client's name. Uh, which is... Uh, you, I'm sorry you want well, to be taken out and <laughs> summarily yeah. shot yes, for doing you know, that. I, I actually think it's a third one, yeah. that is by promising to do something yeah. by tomorrow yeah. because and, your and client expects it and not doing it. I'd rather we say to everyone, even if you can do it tomorrow, mm -hmm. unless you're absolutely certain, don't say it. Say you'll do it in three days' time. Mm -hmm. Do it tomorrow and your client, you're managing your client's expectations. Sure. That's the only way in which a client's going to be happy. It's, it's, it's as if you're going to predict in property terms to investors what your property is going to reap, what the value of that property on sale. If you are confident, it, for instance, it's going to double in price, you say that to one of your investors, mm -hmm. and it's, I don't know, a thousand pounds less than a double, and they're disappointed. Mm -hmm. But if you actually underplay your performance in mm -hmm. some way, manage the expectation, and the client's going to be happy. And yes. That's halfway to managing your client's expectation. It's difficult to do because yes. clients do require things to be done immediately. And but I do think they understand if you are honest with them. You say, "Look, I'd love to do it today, but honestly, I can't read a thousand folios now. I've got to take two days <coughs> to do that." Yes. Clients will understand, but they'll also push you. Well, indeed, but I think that's but that, that's I think is that not about having a Adopting a mature approach to the relationship that you have with your clients. And, uh, and that sort of approach demands honesty, openness, probably quite directness, but not yeah. rudeness and things. Oh, yeah. All about sort of integrity and trust and credibility and almost doing what you said you were going to do when you say you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Because nothing worse than not doing that because it just completely undermines yeah. trust and, and, and yeah. things. And, and also it's got to be a little it's got to really be bespoke in many ways. You yes. can't you, you have to understand your the particular client's requirements. Yes. Because even in identical transactions different clients may have different requirements. Mm -hmm. And you've got to realise what they are. You can't just say, well this is our procedure yes. and and uh, take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to adapt. Uh, and different and clients do vary 
huge, a huge amount. And that's about listening. Yeah. You know, when you go to see a solicitor, we tell our partners and our assistants, say, look, listen to what your client has. You don't have a preconceived idea of how you're going to deal with something until you've heard your client. You know, he's or she is the one who's giving you instructions. Your job is to extract those instructions, yeah. listen to them, mm -hmm. see what they've got to say, then come to your final view on what's how you going to manage it. So ultimately that's all about the people. Yeah, correct. And all about your people, your team. Yeah. So do you, can you train that skill, or that sort of attitude, that behaviour, or do you recruit for it? I mean, how do you maintain that sort of, yeah, as you grow? It's a combination of both. It's a bit of both. It's, right. It's a bit of both. Yes, you can train. You can train. I mean, it depends. I suppose to how, how long in the tooth the person is you're training. <laughs> I mean, some people obviously get to a certain stage in their career where you know, it's not so easy. But, but you must, must agree that there's, there's there, particularly in professional services and, and some elements of the, the, the law, there are many that are probably not cut that way, yeah. as it were. And actually listening and being responsive to, you know, to the client is... It's just not the way that they, they've either been trained or raised or, or the way that they think. And so you're looking for a particular type of people. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, most of the people who we have recruited for the time have sort of grown up with us. And uh, I mean, some, some of them have been trained here you know, right from the beginning. Uh, and others have come fairly early on in their careers you know, when they are, if you like, still adaptable. Yeah. Um, and they have adapted. And... Uh, They've understood the ethos of the firm and what we're trying to do. Okay. Uh, so it has has worked. It has worked pretty well. I'm not going to say it's worked hundred percent because obviously even what is individual. Yes. But it has worked uh, overall. It's worked well. I mean, what I think is it is also really interesting is because I picked this up from the yeah. the re reception. This is the, your little um, folio brochure type of thing, which I think is really nice actually. What I think stands out with all of this is one is all the quotes that are on it from clients, and two that the the things that are almost like emboldened in all of this because it almost speaks to your values and what you're trying to deliver. A lot of it's about service and about relationships and everything else, and so that's almost like that's the thing that's the headline on the masthead which goes, it's all about you. It's not about us as a as a law firm. This is all about sort of you, because I think that's really different to most law firms. Do you not think? Well, look, I mean, a firm of this size. Yes. Uh, you know, clients have a choice. They can go to a large, a large firm. Yes. Be dealt with, depending on the level of their of the work that they're doing, but yeah. probably be unlikely to be dealt with by a partner. Uh, you know, maybe, but it's a large firm, and you have to deal with it in the way that large firms do. Or you can go to somebody who will do it cheaply. Or you can come to a firm like this where what we the, the whole rationale is service. Yes. That's it. And that if we don't give good service. This sorry, but it's partner led the, service. Yeah, partner led, led yes. service. There, there is there's no point. Yes. Uh, because but that's what we're offering. So you're actually not competing with the um, the commodity players. No, you're not. And you're not competing with the big firms. You are saying. We're specific. We are here. We're very focused, but we are, and this is the partner-led service kind of model. You, you get what you pay for, yeah. I guess. We we spent a lot of time, funnily enough, um, looking into how we'd be providing a service. We had many meetings with a PR company. Okay. We never used the PR company to promote us. Yeah. But it was a very very interesting series of meetings in which they put up a storyboard. They said, what's this? What colour do you want? That's how we got black and red, but that's another story. We yes. don't like it, but that's one of those things. But during those discussions, they were saying, what are your values? What do you want to provide? Yeah. What yeah. sets you apart? And, you know, faced with these questions, it's quite difficult to analyse what sets you apart. Yes. And we came up with, at the end of all of these discussions, one thing that we said, we all agreed on, was we want to provide a first-class service. That was our key word. That yeah. was what we want to live by. Yes. And it was quite interesting. Of all the things we discussed, that's the only thing I really remember. Yeah. The commonality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was the most important thing. It was just like it, in, it in, encapsulated everything in a single, simple few words. Yeah. And that's what we tried to achieve. 
I just think it's, it's uh, difficult. Yeah, and yeah, well, and challenging, but you have to keep going. You have to do it. Well, I think so, and I think it's it's absolutely essential in in the modern in the modern world. I think that what I find is really interesting about the story. I mean, you may be not the biggest firm, and you may not be the oldest firm, but you because the merger happened eleven years ago. But they've got history, be, you know, before that. But that, I think that's by the by. I think what's really interesting is the fact that you figured out what you are about and what you want to achieve and what, you want to, what you're here to do. And that just permeates the whole sort of firm and also permeates and dictates the, sort of the structure that you've adopted and the model and, and your mm-hmm. focus and, and everything else. And I think that's the thing that I find is, is quite interesting mm-hmm. is because it does set, yourself, set you apart. It mm-hmm. does make a statement that we are first class service but it's a partner led first class mm-hmm. service and it's very it's a very it's a very niche focus yeah well i think i think that that, that is right and you know one of the things that i actually most enjoy is when we do bring in somebody from another firm mm-hmm. and you you say to them after they've been here for a little while you know how you find you can so they and they say this is so much better mm. than where we were. Right. Uh, now, you may say they're a bit jaundiced because they obviously left there for some reason, but on the other hand, you know, they are comparing what should be in many cases like for like, and they say it's, no, there's no comparison. Mm. And that actually makes me very happy because it does mean that we're obviously doing something right. Yeah, it's, um, it's a, if you like, external validation. Yeah. Right? See, I think that providing a first-class service is also about having a well-bonded team here. Right. We've had over the last week four or five commercial transactions come through. Mm-hmm. It's very stressful for our corporate and commercial department. Mm-hmm. But they roll up their sleeves and they get on with it and they ask, you know, they ask for help elsewhere as well where they can. Yeah. And everyone's willing to drop everything and to dive in and help everybody. Cross departments. Exactly. Because Brilliant. whilst there is there are targets that people have to reach, they're not strict targets. The greatest, as I said, I keep going on to it, it on about this, the, it's the first class service. The target is to provide the service to clients. And it's not necessary that somebody build more at the end of the year that's going to get a bigger bonus. It doesn't work like that here. Mm-hmm. It's about how we all help each other, mm-hmm. Contrib- contribute to the, the practice, and, and working on the name. So people hear the name, they say, oh yeah, yeah, that's a nice firm. They give a good service, they're tough. You know, litigators, yeah. they're efficient at this, they are you know, hard negotiators. So how do you measure? That's how we deal with it. First class service. By managing by managing the client's expectation. Okay. By being honest with clients, which isn't just a benign statement. It's where somebody comes in and says to you, Will you will you do an aircraft lease? Yeah. And we say, Well, I'm really sorry, we'd love to work with you, but we can't do it. Many firms say, yes, of course we can. They won't say no. We all say no if that area of expertise is not within. We can't perform it to the level we want to. So you can't do aircraft leases? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's one way of managing first-class service, and that is giving, make, ensuring the client knows that we're honest with them. Okay. Returning calls, performing in accordance to the timing, negotiating hard, mm-hmm. and having a very high level of skill, legal knowledge, mm-hmm. and demonstrating that to clients. Mm. And I think lastly, um, it's, it's exactly what, what you said earlier, and that is that um, when someone comes to you with a problem, funnily enough, you do want them to leave without it and to feel it's on capable shoulders. Yeah. Because that's the key. Generally, whatever it is, people come to a solicitor because there's a problem. Mm-hmm. Whether it's going, they want to buy a house, they want to have confidence that it's going to be on safe shoulders and safe white hands. Sure. If they've got a business to buy, the same. And they've got to have confidence. By instilling confidence in the client and then, of course, performing. Mm-hmm. They're the key elements. And that provides, and of course, managing their expectations. That is how, in my view, we provide a good service, first class service. So that, that, those, correct me if I'm wrong, but those feel like internal sort of measures. Do you measure sort of externally as well? I mean, in terms of, because those, those are the standards that you are setting for yourselves that, you know, to achieve. Do you validate them through uh, any external measures? Yes. Well, we, we um, in residential property transactions, we do a uh, customer satisfaction. Okay. Which, um, 
I'm pleased to say, comes back very positive actually, which is not not you know, not everybody returns it obviously. No. So, but the ones that we have had back on have been. I don't think we've had one that's been really yeah, critical. Some lovely comments. Some very man. nice comments. But I guess the uh, but you also said that one of the primary drivers of the business and they also the, the growth and development of the business is has been word of mouth anyway. Yes. And I guess that's the um, one of the biggest yeah. validations. Yes, yeah. yeah. so I think whatever you do, I mean, obviously, you know, they, when they removed the restrictions on advertising, there was sort of rash of adverts on on uh, commercial radio stations and so on yes. for solicitors, but they've really uh, mostly stopped doing it other than some PI firms. Yeah. I don't think because I don't think achieved anything very much because people want to be told, yeah, you know, it's like if you like, it's like in any case, like a doctor or a you know, or, or any any professional really. Yes. They, somebody wants to know that, that one of their predecessors as a client has had a good service, mm -hmm. and uh, that, you know there are not many ways of finding that out other than it's not like if you want to stay at a hotel you can look on TripAdvisor and see all the reviews. You sometimes wonder whether some of them are manufactured, but you know what I mean. Sure. You can look on there, or for restaurant you can see the reviews or read it in the paper. You won't find many reviews or any reviews anywhere like that on, on, on solicitors uh, not you I mean they, maybe what's a cap in the well, maybe, maybe, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe maybe there is maybe there yeah, is but you, you, you don't find very much you, actually occasionally you see something but it's very un, uh, it's very rare so the only way that you're going to be anyone's going to say anything nice about you uh, unless you say it yourself of course is um, is, is for a client to tell somebody else that you know, they, they had a good experience, sure, um, and that's why that, that is, and, and that will, as things stand, that will always be the the main uh, way to, to attract clients. Okay. Is to that. I mean, you can go to all the networking and marketing. If you go to a networking event, you know, if if you meet somebody there who just happens to want your particular thing at that particular time, it can happen. It has happened. Uh, we've had cases where having you gone to a dinner or something, we had the the guy sitting next to us has said, oh, I just need, to, can I come and see you? Well, yes. It has happened, but, but on the whole, most of it is, is referrals. So is there anything, that the, anything else you can, that, that you can think of, you think, well, actually, we've done this, which in our experience is sort of different? Yes. Well, as Michael said, um, every firm has had the opportunity to have a hard time over the last few years, the recession and yeah. everything else. And, uh, being a smaller practice had some advantages because you can move more easily. Yeah. Moving an aircraft takes aircraft carrier takes a lot longer to turn it. But sure. um, having a smaller ship, you're able to invest your money in different areas and to identify areas that are perhaps um, more likely to maintain the status of the practice and to keep it economically sound. Yeah. And uh, we have done a few things. Um, we um, decided that the Russian market was a, a very big market for us, uh, CIS, shall I say. Yeah. And uh, through a lot of years, this was before the recession, this was in 2005, 2006, we were already looking at that market and looking to join up with banks to see if we could have, have referral in, mutual referral of work. Yes. And um, we started to do immigration. And um, that has been a tremendous source of strength for us. It's quite unusual. It mm -hmm. was very unusual at the time. Very unusual. And that's now grown from strength to strength. And we have five or six Russian speakers, um, some excellent lawyers, and um, we all learnt about the Russian culture as well, because it's not just about speaking the language and any of us doing the work. We have to also understand their culture. And that takes years, because yeah. We found initially we had somebody who spoke Russian who was doing the immigration, and they, they passed the next part of the work on to a property lawyer or business lawyer, and they lose the client because they didn't know how to manage it. Sure. So there's a whole cultural um, learning, and uh, so that's one area in which we've developed. And another area which is, is quite unusual, and that is that we are now recommended solicitors for many panels of large developers. Property developers. Property yeah. developers. Uh, and we act for not only the property developers themselves, but also for the buyers. Okay. And that's given us also a source of international work. And um, 
The problem with that is that you want to give every single one of those clients after service as well, to stay in touch with them, but with the volumes we're dealing with, we find we're struggling to actually manage that. And so it's not is a that a good problem to have? It is a good problem, <laughs> but it's frustrating as well. <laughs> Particularly when you set the standards that, that yeah, you do. That's what I'm saying. You can't necessarily invest enough time in the keeping in touch with clients, because generally you get to know them and you like them. Yes. And you, know, you end up speaking to someone every day for five weeks. Yeah. You can't help but get close to them, and all of a sudden there's a cut-off. Yeah. You don't hear them, but you want to be in touch, but you're busy providing the same level of service to the next person. So, yeah, we've got to manage that. Indeed. I think, but it's difficult to. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so those are, I think, the two areas in particular yeah. that we've demonstrated. And the other area is um, a lot of our clients, our co corporate and commercial clients, are extremely large, other quoted companies or internationally well-known companies. Yeah. And they've tended to migrate more and more from the larger firms they've been dealing with and using us for surprisingly large deals. Um, I deal with a lot of development. And, is, and do you think that's because you are operating the partner-led service? Yeah, 100%. Model. Absolutely. It's interesting. Yeah. They want, like anyone else, one point of contact. Yeah. Really simple stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's really like going, I'm a human being, I need to get stuff done, I want to deal with one human being <laughs> to get stuff done. And they also want, I mean, like, unfortunately I've interrupted you this twice, they also want to be able to phone you at directly. any time directly, just if they've got something to pay, want to turn over, you know? Sure. So it's... it's fascinating. I mean, I think it's, 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 there's a fascinating, but almost like... It's like common sense is not that common. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Type of type of insights yeah. in a way because I think that's one of the things that are fa that's fascinating there around the whole client experience, customer service, all of those different sort of things. Regardless of who you are, it's almost like it's a it's, it's almost like a, we're almost turning the clock back. Yes, yeah, yeah, thirty see, or forty years going. Sorry. We want the personal service. You've actually mm. hi hi highlighted on something something else which has happened in this profession. Uh -huh. What your your yes common sense. Unfortunately, there is a, a culture among a lot of the, the solicitors' profession now is that you are not supposed to use your brain at all. Okay. You're not supposed. You're, you're supposed to go along. You know, you're told. You're given the procedures. You yes. go along those procedures. You stick by the rule book. Uh, I'm not saying we should go against the rules, but you know what I mean. Yes. You, you do it this way and this way. This only. is the process. And, and you mm. follow and the, the process. process. Follow the process. And you you're not allowed to to, to think outside the box. Or anything like that. A lot of firms now discourage that, and uh, well, it's, I mean, it's totally anathema to me, frankly, Ooh. because you know you're supposed to give a client the overall service. I come back to that word. Yes. And you can't do that. Well, service is organic. Mm. It is. Yes. It's not mechanistic. Mm. But it is. Well, unfortunately, that is exactly. What Otherwise, it, it'll be vending. I mean, I, I've got yeah. I've got a, lot, a number of friends who are partners in large firms, and that is exactly. I mean, they, they it frustrates them. Because they are told basically, this is the way you have to go. You could, mechanistic is exactly the word. Go like that, so that the wheels go in that direction. And um, and if you don't, if you ever if you don't go outside of that, you won't go far wrong. Right. Well, that's true. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it doesn't give the clients a proper. Well, that's like paint, painting by numbers. It is. Painting by numbers doesn't create art. No, it is. It just creates blobs of paint. And it makes it actually very difficult sometimes when you're dealing with those firms on the other side. Yes. Because you know you want to explore certain issues relating to the transaction and there's no there's no a, a availability of, on their side to do it. Yes. You, you know they just can't do it and sometimes they have to go and ask colleagues whether they can do this or they have to even worse I had a case a few years ago where I wanted um, a client I said look the client, we need to have an indemnity from the other side for this. And they said, um, I told, I'll, ask, I'll ask them. So I spoke, it was a, in, a, quite a senior person in a, a large firm, and I said, yeah, I think we can't need an indemnity from your client. And the response was, uh, yeah, I can understand that. I'll pass the file over to the indemnity department. And you know, you begin to think, well, number one, how can anybody be so, have such a boring job as to sit there drafting indemnities every all, all day? But even so, you know, there was no coordination, you know. Sure. And they, they, there was nobody there who could see the transaction overall. Yeah. Which is which is very important, and it, it was it surprised me because it was a real lack on their on their part, not to be able to see exactly how this transaction should be structured. I think I think that this you're right. 
And what you said earlier, and that is that a piece of art is not created by drawing by, by Paper connecting numbers, a, yeah. number of, a number yeah. of dots yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. I always say to people, they say, what is law about? Because they just think it's a procedural sort of thing. You know, you hand them a commercial contract or a development contract. You just join the numbers, you fill in the gaps, and that's the document. Well, it's nothing like that. No. You have to be creative. Mm -hmm. It does set you aside on performance level. Mm -hmm. You have to identify problems and say, and this is our policy anyway, it's not why can't we, we say how can we. Mm -hmm. It's a different question. Well, it's a mindset. But the se exactly, and training that into lawyers as well is critical. Well, we had training sessions and we asked, you know, what's the problem here? How can we get around it? We have weekly meetings in our property department, as an example, mm -hmm. and uh, we sit around and discuss issues we've got. Not about issues that are going to stop a transaction, rather an issue that how are we going to do something which is going to assist it. Sure. How can we speed think, it up? Yeah, yeah, speed it up. Uh, and you haven't come to a brick wall, you've got to get over it. Yeah. yeah. These are critical. But it's also, but, but, yeah, I think that's absolutely right, but it's also like, it's, it's stuff that's embedded in your culture. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the, you know, the ethos of the firm. And, and I think it's fascinating that many big quoted firms are actually coming to you because they're saying, we just want what you're selling. Yeah. And really, you know, really, really, you know, really, really simply. And so I think that's, you know, that's fantastic. And it's a really it's fantastic insight into how you sort of doing that. But so, gentlemen, I have, I, and this is my final question because I always end uh, these interviews on this uh, this question. And it, that is, is there anything that you would like to shamelessly plug? <laughs> shamelessly plug. Only that. Do you know what? It's a very interesting <laughs> question because I haven't, I haven't really got anything to shamelessly plug. I tell you that, that I just say that if, that I am absolutely confident that clients who come here receive honesty. Uh, they receive directness. They don't always get the advice they <laughs> want to get. I think that they won't get value. They won't. They won't have the cheapest service. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that shamelessly plugging would be don't go to the cheapest firm because you're not going to get the best service. Go to a firm, if it's us or anybody else, mm -hmm. who you honestly believe is going to give you the best advice and be prepared to pay for it. Do I'm think... not plugging this firm, I'm saying generally and a piece of advice for clients. Be prepared to pay for it because mm -hmm. they say if you pay peanuts you get monkeys and it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To get quality, you've got to pay for it. I and mean, we do charge properly. We're not expensive at all, mm -hmm. but we're not cheap. We, we set ourselves as a middle-of-the-road firm, forward-thinking, creative, and extremely professional. The quality respects. costs, but isn't necessarily expensive. Yeah, yeah exactly. The two, there is an analogy between oh. what you pay and what you get. Yeah. I would say that, I mean, in fact, we spoke about this only around this table last week, quality is our byword. Uh, I think we have a fantastic team here, and I'm not going to say that there aren't other firms that are as good, but I think you find it difficult to have things done better than you will here. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Thank you.